Hi, a uh, very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I think we'll just wait for one or two minutes more uh, for uh, others to join in and then we'll start. Hope that's okay with everyone. So while we are waiting, would anybody like to share how their day has been? Has it been uh, busy, messy, smooth? Anyone? My day has been very relaxing. If anybody else would like to share. I hope all of you have your uh, afternoon tea with you. My day was awesome. I'm at school. Everybody else has a break. Uh, I was at, uh, handling admissions. Okay, and, great. Uh, specifically today, we had four uh, grade one admissions and I was just monitoring the entrance and I was just thinking how age plays a role. For the same class, there was a child who was born in uh, November 2018. There was a child born in December 2019. The difference in bit, uh, between the kids uh, in the ability to understand something and all that. But even, each, even uh, within a gap of one year. One year. One year made a big difference the way they were. But every child is unique. Yes. yes. Like being the principal, normally what happens is I'll get the paper down. I, I'll know, I, have, I haven't sat with the children for a while. Hmm. But today it was... Uh, so mesmerizing to see how their brain works with the same concept how different brain works it is great, quite interesting great. thank you so much ma'am for sharing that thank you thank you i think uh, we should begin now and we will be admitting people as and when they join uh, so good afternoon everyone i am priyanka uh, from madhubun and I will be moderating this uh, session today on behalf of uh, Ms. Himani Mittal. Uh, a few ground rules before we uh, begin the session. So please keep yourselves on mute all the time. And if you have any question or if, if you want to share your experiences, only then unmute yourselves. You can also raise your hand and we'll uh, unmute you if required. And please use the chat box uh, as much as possible to raise your questions. So uh, today's session is actually a Q&A session uh, where Ruma ma'am will be taking up all your queries uh, that you've posted so far. Um, if anybody would like to pose another question that you might have, uh, you can uh, raise it in the chat box and I'll take it up for you and I'll uh, share it with Ruma ma'am during the session. And uh, before we begin, I would like to briefly introduce you uh, to our esteemed uh, resource person. Ms. Ruma Purka uh, for today. So Ruma ma'am dons many hats. Uh, she's a psychologist, educationist, and a well-being mentor. She is currently working as an educational consultant and as a specialist with many publications, schools, 
and is also a member of the Cyber Peace Foundation. A former principal of Navy Children's School in New Delhi, uh, she is currently a visiting faculty member in the Department of Psychology at Amity University. With this vast experience by her side, she also engages in teacher mentoring and educational consultancy by taking numerous sessions on administrative and academic activities for new as well as established schools all across the country. Uh, welcome, ma'am, on behalf of Madhuban Educational Books. Over to you. Thank you for all that. And uh, good evening, everyone. As Priyanka said, I do hope you have your cup of tea or coffee with you because this is tea time. I do. I, I am, I've got my cup with me. So as uh, Priyanka said, you know, over the last one year at every session, there were a lot of questions which we couldn't answer at that particular time. So today we've taken up those questions. And I hope while we go through the questions, they answer all your queries. But if there are any more, please keep writing in and we'll try and take them up when uh, at the end of it or during the session as uh, as required. So, uh, well, once again, thank you for being here. It's a nice long weekend and you all have taken time out. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people may not be able to join because they're traveling and they're out of town. So thank you. I'm going to start with one of the first questions that came to me, came to us, sorry. Uh, Avantika, we could put the question up. It says, uh, how to indulge kids? That's the question that came in. And I was a little foxed by this question because I really don't know whether we should indulge kids or no. Because indulging someone is to allow them to do or take what they want. And indulgence, of course, how, how much you indulge them, when you indulge them is, again, very subjective. But too much indulgence makes them selfish. So, and you know, today there's a lot of research going on on this field. And, uh, they, you know, there are researchers who've been working on this and they find that overindulgence, which is what is happening nowadays, because we're giving them, it's happening in three areas. We're giving them too many toys. We are enrolling our children into as many activities as possible. A child is, you know, after school, a child is doing so many things. We're giving them so many electronics. All this becomes a little harmful. And, and when they are indulged too much, we forget that you know, children need downtown, downtime. They need to be able to figure out how to entertain themselves. I mean, I, of course, am several decades older, but I do know that at one time in the summer holidays, I remember asking, telling my mother that I'm getting bored. And she turned around and she told me, look at the ceiling and count sheep. And I don't know. I, I really don't know how I reacted, but I figured out a lot of things. I read books, which is what I think a lot of y'all may have done while you were growing up. And that's how we learn to entertain ourselves. We discover our hobbies. So why indulge them? At the same time, I'm not saying don't indulge them. But of course, as teachers, we have to be very, very cautious. Parents, as it is, are overindulging them. Now, when you know a little child comes to school, we are looking at early childhood, right? Most of you here at this foundations is catering to early childhood. Now, there are strangers all around the child. Obviously, the child shrinks a little. So our duty becomes to make them comfortable. Give them an atmosphere where they feel welcome, where something is interesting. Because unfamiliar surroundings can provoke a stress reaction. And we'll go to stay, uh, things this later. So, you know, I, there's a word nowadays I find a lot of uh, schools are using. Our classrooms are very homey. H-O-M-E-Y. We make them comfortable. We have a little corner with, uh, you know, with toys, a little corner where a child can rest, etc., etc. So, making them comfortable when they come to school. And of course, reaching out to children, the best way is the play, is the play method. And of course, as you all know here, there's so many ways that play is helpful. Now, where, so indulgence here, I felt that we should not be indulging children. We can give it to them once in a while and I'll explain this as we go along. We had another question that said, <clears throat> 
how to handle problematic children in a class. You know, there is a saying that there are no problem children, there are only problem parents and problem teachers. There's a little cartoon I saw the other day which said, I don't understand. The teacher says, what's your learning style? So the, the child asks him, what's your teaching style? So it's like we need to look at what we're doing. Now, before I explain this, I would like to somehow tell you something that you already know, that what are, I'd like to call this challenging behavior. Whether it's a problem, whether it's difficult children, whether it's special children, distracting children, anything. They're all our challenges that we face. Now, what are the possible causes of challenges? This is what, first of all, we need to remember. It could be health. It could be an underlying medical problem. Maybe the child is experiencing pain and discomfort and is not able to verbalize it. So he's acting it out. It could be behavioral difficulties of uh, autism, ADHD, dyslexia, whatever. When, of course, the process of diagnosing those is different. It could be a change that the child has gone through. A change of school, a change of home, a cha parental issues, maybe a separation, maybe the loss of a loved one. It could be anything, any change. Most of the behavior that children portray that we see is learnt. Now, where is it learnt? One is that they learn that if I behave like this, I will get what I want. So it's a learning that's happening. I'm throwing a tantrum or whatever I'm doing and finally the parents are giving in. In the home environment, what is it that is happening? Is there shouting happening? Is there arguing happening or whatever? If it's a, if it's a pleasant home, if it's a normal home where, you know, um, what shall I say, bickering and arguments occur. In every family, there will be arguments, there will be disagreements, there will be fights. But if it's within the normal thing, so what is it that is happening in his learning environment? Because that's how children pick it up. Is the child bored? That's another reason why we have challenges. Maybe we are not able to tap. Maybe the child is finishing work faster or is able. You know, there are some children where the mind works faster than the hand. And generally, those kind of children find it difficult to write. So, which whatever it is, maybe as so what we need to do there. And students struggle because they don't know how to cope. And of course, if there is lack of routine. So, these are some of the challenges that we face within this domain. We need to see what are the challenges that are happening. So, if there is any problem any kind of a problem that as we, I particularly personally don't like the word problem, any challenge that you're facing, what are you going to do? You have to become more vigilant towards the child. Recognize what is the child's problem, the root, where is the thing problem? And all of you here are psychologists and counselors. Every teacher is a psychologist, every teacher is a counselor. Yes, some of them are, some are specialized in their field, but at least basic psychology, child psychology and basic counseling, I think every teacher knows or should know. You have to relate to this unacceptable behavior. Relate to it. I'm not saying condone it. You have to relate to it at their level to figure it out what's happening and finally assist it. So you have to be vigilant, find the root cause, relate to this behavior and then give guidance. Only then will this challenge be. Now, problem behavior is behavior that is undesirable. As per the norms. So it is in a social context. In a particular school, every school has its own vision, has its own ethos, acceptability, non-acceptability. So it has to be in that context. Every culture has something which is, you know, accepted there and not accepted elsewhere. We all know that. So when you look at challenges, please look at them in their context. And especially children when they move, you know, in a country like ours, a child moves from the east to the west, east India to western India. There's a lot of coping the child has to do or from the north to the south to the south to the north. So Obviously, the ch there would be differences. The child is going to take some time. I'm just giving you an example. A child will take some time to adjust 
what he found, he or she found acceptable and very nice in one area may not be accepted in another area. So these are things that we need to remember when we think of challenges, problem children, difficult children or whatever. Basically, when you have children, when, when there is something like this in the class, I think the first thing you need to do is to have patience to cool down, not react immediately. Cool down, get the child some downtown, let the child, he or she sit for a while, you cool down yourself, then take. Don't react immediately because sometimes we say or do things that we might regret later. Be democratic in your approach. Don't get into a power struggle. I'm the teacher, how dare he or she say this to me? No, don't get into a power struggle because you're dealing with a little child. Understand, as I said, understand the root cause because the purpose could be getting attention. It could be a sense of power by throwing a tantrum. It could be wanting to control. It could be revenge. It could be just showing feelings of failure. So understand why it is happening and where it's coming from. Sometimes it helps to do the opposite of what they expect you to do. You know, children sometimes know you. Of course, they know you. They expect a certain answer. If I'm supposing a child is wanting to step out of class or something, the child knows that the teacher is now going to say, stop it, don't go out. What are you doing? Give an answer which is not expected. You will get the child's attention because they often anticipate a response. Like if, uh, you, if uh, they expect you to say stop, get back, go back into the classroom, you can always say you look very smart there, but why are you playing there? Why not come inside? You look equally smart here. Just a different response from what you are doing every day. That helps because it brings them down to Mother Earth. Find something positive to say even when you're scolding them. You were doing so well. What happened to you this time? I'm sure next time you'll pick it up. So while you get the point across that, okay, I'm not very happy with what you've done this time, you are capable of performing better. And, you know, in our mundane day-to-day -day work that we are going, we often forget these things. I think that's one of the reasons why we have these refresher calls. I like to call the webinars refreshers because it's not something that you don't know. It's just that someone is telling you, so you sort of think, okay, I could do this. Don't be bossy because it reflects bad, bad behavior. You're going to be bossy, they're going to pick it up then they are going to be bossy somewhere. So it's not nice to be bossy because you're reflect, you know, you'll they'll only pick up a bad, you'll be a bad model, not a good model. So don't do that. Praise children, give them a sense of belonging, you know. Praise, praise children's effort. Pursue interactions. When I say that, I'm saying go up, down, up, you know, we call it up, down, up means you praise the child for something that he did yesterday. Today he's done something wrong. Bring that praise from yesterday. Yesterday you were you were so good. Yesterday you finished your work in time. What happened to you today? Instead of saying, oh my God, wow, what's wrong with you? The bell is about to ring and you haven't finished your work. Or whatever is your context. So yesterday you finished your work in time. Today you haven't done. Come on, finish it. Maybe tomorrow you'll be better off. So while you're bring, bringing out something, please praise them. Because... It helps, you know, and also have faith in them, you know, because if they do something wrong, like breaking something or, you know, breaking a rule or doing something that they should, because they're little children. It's always nice to tell them that I know it won't happen again. It was just a mistake today. Never mind. It helps. Of course, if the behavior is repeated 10 days for 10 times, then you'll have to take a different action. But it's a, it's a good way to calm children with challenges. And of course, as I said, Care for them, respect them, listen to them. It's important. We don't listen, we only hear. A few days ago, I was talking to someone. We were talking and this person turned around and said, uh, Ruma ma'am, I think you're only hearing me. You're not listening to me. Because while I was hearing, I was trying to type a message on the phone. And she was right. Well, you know, something was happening, but I was not so, I put it down and I said, okay, I'm sorry. Let me listen to you. So listen to them. Don't hear them. Okay. And allow them to express their opinions. And in the little ones, so we always say if, the, if they draw the sky green or they draw the sky yellow or they draw it red, we still allow them to draw it because they're developing their imagination. As they grow older, they'll realize that the sky, we are supposed to draw the sky blue. Isn't it? So that's about problematic 
children. Keep your cool, watch your body language, listen to them. You know, sometimes we call it playing detective. Now, what do we do with lazy or slow learners? This was another question that came. Now, lazy learners and slow learners are different. They are not the same. Laziness is due to lack of motivation. Don't we get lazy if there's no motivation? On a Sunday, there's no motivation to get ready and go to work. So I'm lazy. I tell myself I deserve it. Today is my day of rest. Yes, but if I'm sitting at home every day and not doing anything, it's lack of motivation. So please understand that the lack of motivation gives rise to laziness. So what are the reasons for it? There has to be a reason for that lack of motivation. Because once they get into the pattern of being lazy, it's very difficult for them to bounce back. Then they gradually progress. They're not completing their, as they grow older, they won't complete their work. Their homework will not be done, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So find the cause for motivation and get your parents involved in this. Because there are certain points for lazy children. I'll, don't make it too easy for them. You know, there's a saying, you know, great things never come from comfort zones. If you're in a comfort zone, you won't do anything. And laziness is a nice comfort zone where I'm sitting. So don't make things too easy for them. And all these things you must, if you're doing it in school, the parent also should understand and to take parents on board when you're dealing with lazy children. So initially, of course, when you make things difficult, the child is going to be furious. But in the long run, the child will understand the value of things. So be prepared for a tantrum or what a, a reaction if you make things a little tough. You can give them rewards. That they look forward to the rewards. Make them do chores, daily responsibilities. As teachers, you can figure out what is it that they can do. Get parents to make them do chores at home. Let them understand that for what, like a simple thing like assisting the mother in the kitchen. With whatever. I mean, I'm not saying they're going to cook their little babies, but whatever chores they do. Somewhere they have to understand that what they are for what there is a lot of work that goes into what they are getting. Gradually they will start understanding. So it's that no work, no pay, no. It's that in a different form. So they have to understand. Be an example. You know, if I've always told parents that you are trying to get your child to be not lazy. You're trying to see if your child is regular and in, you know, consistent and in time. Now you're sitting at home and watching TV and you have all your chores left and you're saying, oh, I don't feel like doing it. I don't feel like doing it. So you're setting an example for laziness in the house yourself. So these are things that you have to tell parents because it's not something that only you in school can. It has to be a consistent effort between the parents and the school. So no matter how busy you are, the parent has to find time and you also have to allow children time to get into this habit of doing chores. Set expectations. Tell the child in your class that today I expect that you will finish this work. We do all that. You won't finish, you won't go to play. You won't finish, you won't do this. It's okay. Continue doing it. The child has to learn. But yes, if the child is lazy and you've done four pages... Let this child do two pages, first day. Gradually increase it because that little bits of success that they get helps them. We, we follow this little bits of success program even in senior school. Children who are not studying, board exams are on their head. One question paper, the easiest question paper they do, they get their marks, they feel happy. They feel, oh, oh okay, I can do it. It's not so bad. So it's the same principle. Little success but set expectations that I expect you to finish this. Of course, simple tasks reduce their sense of entitlement. I'm sitting, I'm getting everything. And, and please, parents have to know this. Everything can't be handed over to the child. The child has to, you know, there are children where, of course, little babies have to be fed and all that. I'm not saying that. But, you know, your glass of water or something, pass me this, pass me that, give me this, give me that. Those who are not lazy, it works. But for lazy children, it doesn't work. They have to move. Physical exercise is a must for them because they have to be engaged instead of sitting around. 
the lazy children please encourage the attribute the attitude of generosity of giving and i am not talking in terms of money or anything giving today let you have okay you've got to share your pencil with somebody get up go give your pencil to somebody you are playing this is a game that in which we share you have to share you have to play all this is an effort for the child to come out of that zone of comfort that the child gets into it okay and a lot of uh, there's a lot of studies that support the concept of outdoor work and exercise because when you do outdoor work you're exposed to nature it increases your energy and when you it increases your energy your sense of well-being so encourage outdoor activities for them if you do these things basically identify what motivates them and that would help you okay now every child has what it has what it takes to motivate that child you have to discover it maybe for me uh, writing one page instead of four pages is motivating maybe for another child doing 10 sums instead of 20 is motivating or whatever is your curriculum so you have to find different things will motivate different different children because as we all know every child is unique all right now let's come to slow learners what exactly is a slow learner a slow learner is somebody who's struggling with his work it we use this expression to describe students who have the ability to learn the necessary academic skills but they are slightly lower than the average now for them they are not lazy for them they need more time they need more repetition and as teachers you have to give them more resources so these are slow learners now so for slow learners you have to incorporate some lessons which are interesting for them which are smaller for them like if you've done say seven i was maybe classes 1 and 2 if you've done say five question answers or whatever in class or in your activity sheet you've got about 10 things allow this child to do seven or six and appreciate the child as much as you appreciate somebody who's quickly finished ten so the child is at par you are appreciating him the same way because you are appreciating him for the ability that he has so you are making that child feel normal so that is what you need to do in again we go back to auditory learners and visual learners and kinesthetic learners every learner learns differently it has to be a multifaceted way of teaching especially in the in the younger classes so you have to find out what is it that this child responds to so if you do that make it interesting make it fun and you know slow learners depend more on concrete things if you will let the tell the child okay go to the washroom and you give directions you can often tell them when the child comes back and tell how did you come back can you draw and tell me so you know you probably draw a room you probably draw a line you probably because little children have to go to the washroom they can wash their hands they can play around there so it becomes a concrete experience for them the ability to think abstract comes a little later not in the not when they are so small and of course for slow learners also you have to work very closely with the parents okay but please remember that they are slow learners they are not dyslexic they are not low iq as such yes they may be a little lower than average but they can perform in the class provided you lower your expectations of them and treat them the same way and not you know what happens is we don't identify them they don't finish their work and then they become oh then they start failing then they don't go up to the next class and then it's just a question of a drop out so we need to deal with them differently all right now we have another one which says how do you handle a child who comes late to class consistently ma'am before that i have a follow up question yes so just curious uh how much is technology supposed to be blamed for all this this so called problematic or less motivated no uh, you know so um, do we just use this as an excuse technology has its benefits but unfortunately you know a lot of children have benefited greatly from technology but wherever technology has been used as an escape 
I need to do my work. Let me hand, hand the iPad over to my child. Over there, it does not work. It, it doesn't have very nice consequences. If you use technology for, okay, you have limited screen time. There are so many apps for little children, you know, that they can use. You use those, there's nothing wrong with them. Because see, one thing is we have to accept that this these children now, the babies now, are technologically advanced. They have been born into a technology, I mean, uh, there is a word for them, I'm forgetting. So we can't take away technology. For all you know, by the time 15 years later, they may not require the writing skills. They probably do everything on the, on the computer. But we have to still give them the basic skills. So I won't say that there is no, that technology is bad or it's uh, reduced their motivation. It has not provided, it is used with conscientiously. You know, but at the same time, once in a while, you do allow your child to watch something, but it shouldn't be that for four hours every day, my child is sitting and watching, watching or playing. Then that's wrong. Obviously, that's more interesting. I'm sitting and watching. No other faculty hand legs are being used. I am going to turn into a couch potato. Okay, so properly used, guided usage, there's nothing wrong. Okay, how will you handle a child? I hope I have answered your question. Absolutely, ma'am. Thank you. How will you handle a child who comes late to class consistently? Uh, my dear friends, when we are dealing with early childhood and children up to class one and two, we have to talk to parents. Maybe they are late. Maybe they are getting up late. Maybe they are not getting in, in time. So it could be that. So first thing to do, if it's, if it's older class, of course, you can use detention, you can use marks, you can use, you know, all kinds of things. But for little children, we have to deal with parents because they're being dropped or they're being dropped to the bus stop or whatever. So it becomes a parent's responsibility to see that the child gets up in time and comes. However, if there is a child who doesn't want to come to school, then we need to find out what has happened. Why does a child not want to come to school? My first thing always when I, when I was in school, I would say, the child must want to come to school. The child should look forward to school. The child should be happy at school. All academic work will follow. Because when I'm happy, I'll perform. When I'm happy, I'll learn. When I'm happy, I'll deal with my challenges. In a nutshell. So, and over here, when you talk to parents, I think one thing you must insist on that, look, we do something like uh, most schools do a circle time in the morning or they do something in the morning. That is very important. And your child must not miss that because that sets the tone of the day. And of course, if the child doesn't want to come to school, then we need to look at it as to why the child doesn't want to come to school. So, of course, an older child, the parent often says, I'm leaving at eight o'clock. If you're not ready, I will not take you. It works for children older but not for little children because they have to be dressed and fed and sent. So talk to the parents. If it's consistently late, two things. Is it the parent who's getting late or is the child not wanting to come to school and they're going through one big drama every day of getting the child in time? If the child is not sleeping in time, the child is not going to get up in time. What, what is the child's diet? All those things, you can talk to the parents about that. Okay? Uh, lacks concentration. Solve quizzes before time. Now, <clears throat> if a child lacks concentration, I was not very clear about what you wanted to do in this. But yes, if a child solves quizzes before, he may not lack concentration. He may be very, he or she may be very sharp and finishing work early. And then obviously he's looking around and trying to figure out what the others are doing. So in that case, always have something ready. Maybe some artwork, maybe some written work, maybe just craft, maybe reading or anything that you have. You can either have extra worksheets ready with you that the child can do, depending on the child. Now, if he's solving quizzes before time, you can have a couple of more quizzes ready for him. Maybe he'll do. Then, because his, his uh, grasping power probably is higher than the others. So obviously he's going to finish. When he finishes, his concentration is going to waver. If a child lacks concentration beyond a certain point, then we need to look at it. Children anyway have a very small span of attention. 
So that is why our classes in the kindergarten have to be small. They can be frequent, but they have to be small. After about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, children lose their. They will not be, they will, you know, they've lost it. Then they want to do something else. That is why we do so many breaks. Breaks as in, I don't mean recess. I mean, okay, now let's clap our hands. Let's go out. Let's do this. Every 20, 25 minutes, there's some activity that is happening because it re-energizes them and it's a break from what they're doing because their span of attention is less. Beyond that, if there is a feel that there is absolutely no, no span of attention, that every two, two seconds the child is doing something else, then yes, you need to speak to the counselor, but not otherwise. Okay? Now, how do you handle a child who is not ready to sit in one place and distract others? It's very similar to the previous question, isn't it? So generally, of course, as I said earlier, give them things to do, but you can also do things like Make sure that there is exercise in your daily routine. Find out what they're eating. Check what's coming in their diet. Sometimes I, There's this whole concept nowadays about sugar rush. I know a lot of young parents are very worried about sugar rushes. They're, they're very careful about the amount of chocolates their children eat. And I'm sure the chocolate uh, factories are going to suffer. But uh, so there is this concept of sugar rush. Uh, uh, what kind of junk they are eating? Because, you know, there is a lot of um, a lot of things in junk food, which is actually not good for children. So diet, many parents are unaware of this. So maybe you can educate them. Learn, do a little meditation in your class, even if it is for two, three minutes, nothing. Breathing exercises, just sit, close your eyes. It calms them down. Always have movement breaks, as I said, you know. It helps, especially children like this. Distracted finishes work. Give Okay, now go get that. Take out the book from there. Go this. Thing. You can even tell a child, go to the garden, just see if somebody is there and come back. So it's movement. These kind of children require movement. And if you tell them what to do, it's better. Otherwise, they'll go around from chair to chair and try and figure out, figure out what the others are doing. Make sure to tell parents that their child should get enough sleep. Diet, sleep. It's a deadly combination if it's not done well for little children. Look at ourselves. You think of yourself. If you've gone without sleep and you've gone to work and you don't have food that is nutritious, what is going to happen to you? So it's that much more magnified when we talk to little children. One thing that works very well with children who get distracted is the fidget. I'm sure all of you have seen that fidget that children play with. I don't have one here. It's a triangular thing that, you know, it's like a top that goes on the ground. So basically fidgets that they can move in their hands because, uh, you know, research tells us that when we do physiological stimulation of the hand, tactile, it brings our energy and our attention into a level that allows us to concentrate on the tax, uh, task at hand. So many, many of us, you know, when we think we have a pencil in our hand, I for one, I cannot write, I cannot think unless there is a pencil. I have to do some doodling, I have to do some. So it's because when you are, when you have something in your hand, your tactile, uh, you know, sensors are stimulated. And that is what causes attention, brings in the attention and the focus in your brain. So give, allow children to do these fidget activities. It really helps. If you want to look at fidget activities, just Google fidget activities. You'll get a lot of activities on that because it helps. In this case also, please speak to parents. Tell them that they must have a practice concerted seated time in their homes. The child has to sit for five minutes. At the end of it, you can give them whatever whatever is their reward, uh, something to watch, something to eat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They must have even on a holiday also. It's important for these children to get them to walk. After one hour, go take a walk, go play. Movement breaks, as we call it. We have something called the sit 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 still drill. So sit still drill works with these children. If my child cannot sit still in the class, my child has to learn how to sit still. So sit still drill, you can do it in class. Uh, please ask parents to do it. Begin with once a day, go on to twice a day, go on to three times a day, four times a day. 
gradually the child will learn and look for rewards after that. So these are some things where you need parental involvement. Parents are generally not aware of the importance of these things, you know. So make them aware and this will help. And we go to the... How do I motivate students to write neatly? You know, ask a few questions. Does your hand get tired easily? Does the child hunch over when the child is writing? Very important. So if the, ch if the child gets tired easily means the child needs to focus on some fine motor coordination exercises. Now, if the child is hunched over writing, then try and get a slant board. Allow a slant board for the child to have for some time. Now, you know, what works here is that maybe the lines that are there, they could be raised with, you can put some glue or something so they can feel and they don't go beyond that. That works, but I know it's a tedious process. If they, they use spacing exercises, we used to learn leave one finger space between words. You could get them a little... You know, an ice cream stick or something which in which they learn spacing. Now, these are things that help. If you feel that they are writing and not, you know, sometimes, say the word hop. There's a small H and there is a big capital P, a capital O and a P that's written way above. So there is this game that you can play with them. We call it the sky grass dirt. So you can tell them, all right, now, for tall letters like H, point your thumb to the sky. So, all tall letters, they'll learn your pointing your thumb to the sky. For all small letters, make a fist. Like O. In this H, this is H, this is O. And for letters that point downwards, the thumb goes down. So, if the child correlates this, the child will be able to figure out and if you make, you know, you can even put, make them put colors in those lines. So they write within the lines. It's a tedious exercise in the beginning, yes. But gradually they pick it up. And you can use highlighters on line paper. So can you repeat the name of the game, please? Is what, so? Yes, it's called, you can Google it, st Sky Grass Dirt. Sky Grass Dirt. So thumb up. Fist, thumb down. Yes. Thank you, Priyanka, for writing it. Okay. So you can use these signals for the children when they're writing. You've said H and you've said O and you've said P. So it helps them to relate. Okay, this, the hand goes up, the, the leg comes down, you know, but whichever. You can develop your own if you want, but this is something that's tried and tested. So... It makes it, this helps them to write neatly. Highlighters you can use because it helps. Because you see, handwriting is important to the point that a messy handwriting gets in the way of learning. So, it, if the writing is clear, if the reading is clear, then obviously the learning is going to be faster. You can allow these children a little extra time, or maybe lined paper, space. You get these space lined papers. You can allow them to use these for a while till they get into the habit of it. And here, of course, technology helps. There are a lot of uh, game, you know, that doodling that the children do, that works. They learn to write properly. So you can do that. There are these magic slates where children write. They love writing. They get motivated and they will do that. Okay. So we, then we had another question that says, how do you manage a class without toys? I don't know how. Do we have classes without toys? If we do, there are lots of things that we can do. We have lots of things in our classes. We have chairs, we have bottles, we have a board, we have chalk, we have the children's bags. Let's use them. Put chairs, remove them, concept of zero. There was in one school, you know, I saw this game. I don't have another pencil here with me. Okay, if you have a pencil here, can you, I don't know if you can see the pencil. She had two pencils. And she, the children were standing. So she went like this. One, two, three, four. The children moved backwards. They said one, two, three, four. When she brought it forward, they moved forward. When she took it sideways, they moved sideways. She Sideways. Then she put it down like this. They sat down. It's an activity and children enjoyed it. So you can use, you can develop your own games. There are no toys because you have to make the 
make it, uh, you know, interesting and you have to make create fun. And with these things, of course, please remember the kinesthetic, they like to do themselves, the visual, by seeing things and the auditory who understand best by listening to explanations and discussions. There is this famous game, no rock, paper, scissors. I'm sure everybody knows it. Your rock and your paper and your scissors. I hope I've got it right. It's a game that can play. They can do a little bit of arm wrestling, thumb, thumb wrestling. They love games like this. Clapping, 20 questions. You can do games like, when I went to the market, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Okay, let's see. Let's form a story. So these things, sometimes it helps to get silly also, you know, in your class. Some silly songs, makeup songs. So these things work. You know, the, at another school I found this, uh, they called it uh, the spider walk. Two fingers up the child's arm. We do it with little babies in the house. You can try it in school. Walking up the arm and then you can say, okay, that, that you're going on a hike. I stopped here. Then I went left. Then I went right. So these are all things that you can do without toys. So make your own version of it. You can do imaginary bubbles. You can make imaginary balloons etc. So get creative and do this. Art projects with waste material. I'm sure everybody's got waste material. If you have a little patch, try gardening with them. They'll learn from the environment. Talk to them about animals or whatever is around you. You can pick up some books and read to them if they don't have books. So there's a lot. Use what you have to create games and play with them. That will work. Now, we come to managing special kids. Now, this, I will very briefly touch upon this. Now, who, what is the concept of a special child? A special child is someone who has been identified with requiring special attention and some special necessities that other children do not have. And they are identified and brought into the inclusive setup purely with the purpose of offering them benefits so that they can come to as much normalcy as possible. So their needs are special. They may require more accommodations, specialized services in their everyday activity. So this is the concept of special needs and special child. So there are some early indicators that we have. But I will not go into that, but I want to say a few things here. Please remember that the mind of a child is very fragile. Their emotions touch their future and special children are more emotional than the others. So it is your behavior that shapes them. So be cautious when you're dealing with them. Whatever it is, give them love, encourage them, support them. Don't say, oh my God, I have a special child in my class again. No. The whole reason why they've been brought into the inclusive setup is because we need to bring them into as into normal life. We can't have up to the severe cases I'm not talking about. I'm talking about inclusive education who come into school. So we do that. So generally for special children, what do we do? We show, we demonstrate and we model. We use a multi-sensory multi -sensory approach. They can't write, they will speak. If they can't, if they are finding difficult to speak, they will write. Whatever is the problem with the child, challenge with the child. Information given to them is in smaller units because they cannot process big things. Peer tutoring works with them. Cooperative learning works with them. That's why with them we have the, what we call the buddy system. Information is made as concise and concrete as possible. Instructions are very detailed. So there are these certain five, six things that you have to do to manage special kids. And every special child has a particular program, which I'm sure the special educator or the counselor in your school will give you. So follow that. They'll give you how to break it up, what to do, etc., etc. Okay. So be optimistic and calm when you get a special child in your class. Pay attention to detail. Please educate yourself. There's enough books. There's enough on the net. Everything is a click away. What you don't know, please read. And look for expert guidance when you can. Okay. Let's go to the next one where we have the concept of uh, separation anxiety. Yes. Before we move on to the next question. Yes. Please. There is a question on the chat. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Veer is asking, is it compulsory to opt maths? If the child is not able to do it. 
There is a provision. Uh, it depends on the uh, uh, disability or lack of ability of the child. If a child is dyslexic, if a child has got dysgraphia or dyscalculia, yes, they will be exempted. But then it depends. But otherwise, no. Can you suggest a good handbook for educators? Okay, I will. I don't have the name right now, but I will give it to Priyanka and she can put it on the group. Okay, all right. Yes, so uh, that, I don't know. I mean, if that was answered, but I think for other children up to class 10, so far, maths is compulsory. Let's wait for whatever changes are coming in. I mean, changes have come, the implementation to come in. And I think maths now, I mean, I'm digressing from the topic, but maths now has been made very simple. And with functional numeracy, I think most children should be able to manage it because that's what we are looking at. All right, separation anxiety is a very common, normal experience for children. If you, re I think we also have separation anxiety. When you go to the airport or the station to leave someone, why do you feel bad? Do you have to say bye-bye? That's also separation anxiety. For a little child, the separation anxiety is huge because it's fear of being away from the primary caregiver. Now, typically separation anxiety can be handled. It has three simple stages. Protest, they want you to stay despair, they'll cry and withdraw and throw a tantrum. And after some time, it, we call it detachment because, okay, they'll hold their bag or the book or whatever and they will wait for the caregiver to come back. So this is typically what is separation anxiety. But we can help to, you know, first make the child comfortable, faith, trust, etc. What I spoke about at the beginning, I won't get into it. But yes, you can try breathing exercises with them fun and games with them, reassuring them constantly, have a calming area with stuffed animals, supplies, have a routine. In the first few days, please have a routine for the next one week. For the first one week, do the same. If you're doing maths at nine o'clock, please do number work at nine o'clock. If you're doing, uh, you're taking them out to play at 11 o'clock, Take them out to play. That sense of routine is very, very important. Once they settle down, because the moment you say, because they look forward to routine. Their, their thing is structured. They know exactly what, what is going to follow. They are not able to handle a deviation from routine because they get scared. For a child who is hanging on and not letting go, if you have a clock, tell them that, okay, when the needle comes to this place, supposing it's 12 o'clock, when the needle comes to this place, your mama will come or your father or whoever. So the child knows, okay, that if the clock is ticking at this particular time, now we're 15 minutes away, now we're half an hour away, now we're so much away. It gives them, and please tell the parent to come at that same time every day. It works. It reassures them. So stick to a daily schedule. Have a planned pickup time and reassure the child about the pickup time. In most cases, it works. If, and you know, sometimes it helps to talk to your class about anxiety. You know, I was also very, I don't, don't use the word anxiety, but you can tell them that, you know, sometimes even I am scared or I am I'm wondering what is going to happen now. So they understand. Speak to them about it, that it's normal that everybody has it. You can tell them, you know, first time when I went to school also, I was like you. I hated it, but then gradually I got used to it. So it helps. So you connect. So the child was okay. She also probably had the same problem. Okay. There are lots of books on this. There's a very famous book called The Invisible String by Pat. I'll send, I'll send the word. The Invisible St uh, String. You can try reading that book. And uh, you can read that book out to children also if you think it's nice. I'll send the names of the books. Yeah. Invisible String by Patrice Cast. Okay. Now... You have to give them something to be responsible for to reduce anxiety in the child. Okay? Comfort them. Sometimes he tells them, okay, get photos from home. Validate them. It's okay. I also feel anxious. You're feeling anxious. Mama will come. Constantly you have to do that. Usually it settles down. If it doesn't, then we reach the point of anxiety 
uh, separation anxiety disorder. So we are not talking about that here. We, because that becomes very serious then. So we generally, we don't get to that stage. Children get reassured and they settle down. Okay. I think the next one is about teenagers. So I'm very briefly going to touch upon this. That I, I just want to tell you one thing. That teenagers respond to emotions differently. It's a biological issue. As adults, we learn the ability to read our emotions and understand our emotions. Children, uh, teens, teenagers. Now, when I say teens, I'm also taking in the tweens. Now, 10, 11, and 12, we call them the tween. And from 11, uh, from 13 onwards, they become the teens. Yes, ma'am, this is the book. And uh, because in the adult, science tells us that the prefrontal cortex reads the emotional cues. But in the teens, it's the amygdala that helps them to understand. Now, when it's the amygdala, the amygdala is responsible for emotional reactions. So obviously, the teen is working on emotions. So, you know, very often you'll find teenagers coming and say, she was angry with me. Actually, you've not been angry, but they just read your expression as anger. You know, so we have to understand, if you can understand that they respond they understand emotions differently from adults. I think a lot of it would fall into place. And we judge them according to our thing. But I wasn't angry. Why did you think I was angry? So it helps to say that, child, this is what it is. And I'm not angry. Henceforth, if you see this expression on my face, please come and ask me. I'm not going to be angry. This is just an example, okay? So because they because of this, they misread facial expressions. So, and that's where all your conflict begins. So five things, very briefly, I would like to tell you that for teens, please have a rapport with them. Understand their interests because their interests are very different from yours, yours and mine. Allow them to make a choice. Listen to them. If they're making a choice that you don't approve of, steer them properly. Don't say, oh goodness, what is it that you're doing now? Well, he will definitely do it. So steer it. They get bored very easily. Try and provide variety to them, whether even in terms of food. Very often the teenager will come and say, what is this? I have to eat this every day. For the last 12 years, he's been eating the same thing. But suddenly when they're 14 and 15, they want variety. And they require challenge. So do not play it safe. Challenge them. Make them do things that are difficult for them. They enjoy the challenge. If you don't challenge them, then they get bored. So basically these five things. And with that, I think we come to the end of our, to whatever I have to say. If there are any questions, please. Do we have time? I don't know what the time is. Ma'am, we are just, uh, yes. Okay, we have let's, take, let's take minutes. 10 minutes. That's okay. okay. Let's take 10 minutes and see if there are any more questions. I I hope, these were the questions that came in and I hope uh, they've been answered. There was, uh, there were a couple of other questions. How do we summarize the extensive unit breakup and how can we take up class question and answers in a routine class along with an activity? summarizing extensive breakup again you'll have to look at your lesson plan and how is it that you do it for that we need to work on lesson plans talk about lesson plans we don't have the time question and answers in a routine class allowed by activity I would like to just say one thing why isn't question and answers an activity by itself that's also an activity you know so whatever even question answers is an activity so why are we doing question answers and activity separately so whatever your activity is, weave in your question answers in that. Let's not say, okay, now I've done this activity, so now and now question answers. A question and answers can be part of an activity. Any questions? It's a Saturday evening, start of a holy weekend. So I think we shouldn't take up too much time. <laughs> ma'am, Sonali ma'am is asking if there are any uh, book references specifically for early childhood educators. I, I will get back to you. Priyanka, I'll get back to you yes. on this. Because I there are, but I am not... Uh, 
I don't have it right now with me. Give me a couple of days and I will get back on this. Please read the, I'm sure you've read it, the, the foundation stage booklet that the uh, NEP has brought out. There's a lot in detail in that. If you read that, I don't think you'll need anything else. So please yes, go uh, in detail. Anjali ma'am, you can unmute yourself and ask. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, I'm listening to your session right from the beginning and I'm very much, uh, it has proved very much helpful to me and my teachers also. My school teachers have also joined. Thank you. Um, my question to you is, ma'am, um, can you suggest uh, any kind of uh, course for ECCAD? Like, uh, I, we are from a school in Akola, Maharashtra. Okay. And uh, in our city, we don't have any kind of course available uh, for ECCED. Like, my teachers are really very good. They are doing good job. But uh, still, uh, you know, a certification is needed. You can understand there are certain laws. Yeah. Okay. So, we have done many trainings from... Uh, uh, private uh, yeah. trainers and all. But you need a proper we, certification. Okay. Uh, yeah, we, yeah, we need a, a certification for that. So can you suggest any kind of uh, course for my teachers which can okay. be an online one? And I, okay, some, these these are things that I will get back to you on. Okay, okay fine, ma'am. Definitely. Fine. There is one yeah, if, I, uh, if I Please suggest. see that. Yes, ma'am, ma please see that the information yes. reaches to my Sure, sure, sure. Ma'am, there is one that I can suggest. There is one that I can suggest. Uh, there is there is a there is a new course. Nice Ma'am, there is a lot of noise from some place. Yes, yes. Yeah. Am I am I audible now? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there is a new course by Azim Premji University. Uh, okay. It's it's I think situated in Bangalore, and they also have a campus in Bhopal. I'm not sure. If, I'm not sure if it's anywhere in Mumbai, uh, but okay. they have a postgraduate diploma in uh, early childhood care and education. And if it is a correspondence have, as far course, as that know. will be actually better for my teachers. Correspondence course, if it is. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. It's a, a part-time course. That it is a part-time course. It is a part-time course. And uh, I think as far as I know, there are certificates to it. It's if you do it for a, for a year, you get a diploma. But if okay. you, let's say, do it for three months or something, they give you a certificate. So okay, fine, I think fine. this is one thing that you can, uh, you know, Explore, it's worth, yeah. worth exploring. And okay, uh, ma whatever Ruma ma'am uh, give references, I'll also share those with you. Yeah, I definitely. Give me a couple of days and yeah, I'll yeah, share them with you, Priyanka. Surely, ma'am. Surely. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Please write in to us and tell us that in the coming year, what would you like? What are the gray areas and where would you like? You know, what, what are the gap areas and where would you like? Uh, us to pitch in that that would help us ma'am there is one suggestion from sonali ma'am as well she's saying that ignu also conducts yes. such courses actually i was thinking of saying but i thought i would check it out and then tell you yeah ignu conducts one and yeah, i thank think you, it is correspondence yeah yeah i will definitely search <clears throat> yeah. Uh, but uh, generally what happens, you know, our city is a little bit remote. Like whatever is, you have to go to Nagpur many times. And Ignu earlier I searched, but those people were saying that you have to reach to regional office of Ignu, which is in Nagpur. So leaving the school, teachers cannot go every time. Yeah, obviously. That's why. So that we'll, is why I... Okay, but we'll check this out. There Sorry. are a couple of other organizations, but I'm not often getting their names. That's why I've asked for some time. Fine, ma'am. Fine. Okay. Take your time and please let me know. Yeah, I'll let you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, ma'am, there is a suggestion by Shelly, ma'am, Shelly Malhotra. Yes. Uh, she's requesting uh, to conduct a workshop on learning outcomes and how to plan and execute them for primary okay. students. Okay, we can we can look at that. Noted, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Noted, Shelly, ma'am. We have noted this. Shelly, ma'am, we have noted. Learning outcomes and could you repeat, ma'am, please? How to plan and execute them for uh, primary yeah, students. Primary classes. Yeah. All right. Uh, we'll be happy to take up any more questions. If anybody has any more questions, any suggestions, as Ruma ma'am suggested, what would you like to yeah. uh, have as future se sessions? Anything that is... Uh, particularly especially, uh, Priyanka, I was there suggesting, especially the gap areas, the gray areas where we can be of some help. 
absolutely yes okay otherwise can we just play that video please if uh, everybody is there because yes. i'm sure everybody would like to leave please uh, i'd like you all to see this video uh before avantika just yeah. just a second uh there is another session ma'am uh, mr veer is uh, asking for a session on secondary children as well secondary students for what for secondary children i think uh, learning outcomes is that uh, is that correct sir yeah yes okay learning we'll look at that how to how to plan okay. and execute okay we'll look at that definitely also ma'am so i will get back to you on your query on uh, book references we'll definitely yeah we'll definitely get back to you let's have a look at the video yes everybody gets a heart everybody gets a soul everybody gets a mind to let them know that we can be smart and we can be kind and we can be living by giving and loving all the time so on the days when it's feeling tough and it seems like you don't have enough well let's be thankful for our friends and family and grateful for the air that we breathe and appreciate everything that we have today let's be generous to anyone who has less than us it's good to be compassionate cause ever since the day you were born yeah you've got a lot to be thankful for yeah we've got a lot to be thankful for everybody gets the land and everybody gets a seed so everybody lend a hand to those in need cuz we can be nice we can be nice we can all share and we can keep growing together it's better when everyone cares So on the days when it's feeling tough and it seems like you don't have enough well let's be thankful for our friends and family and grateful for the air that we breathe and appreciate everything that we have today let's be generous to anyone who has less than us it's good to be compassionate cause ever since the day you were born yeah you got a lot to be thankful for yeah we've got a lot to be thankful for so what are you thankful for everything that we have today hey! let's be generous to anyone who has less than us it's good to be compassionate cuz ever since the day you were born yeah you got a lot to be thankful for thankful yeah you got a lot to be thankful for thankful uh huh you got a lot to be thankful for Okay, great. That was a so on that, that was a note, great video. I think we can say thank you, uh, ma'am. There are. I'm afraid there are questions? a few more questions. Yes, yes. I think I can see one on how to educate students to write in effective in exam and handling exam stress. So we could do one on exam stress. And uh, Sonali, ma'am, I would request if it is possible for you to unmute yourself and ask uh, the second question that you had. 
I'm sorry, I missed that. I put yeah, She says she has two queries. Yeah. So or if you can write it there. in the chat box. Hey, yeah, good evening, ma'am. I just wanted to ask that after the pandemic, we are seeing like a drop of admissions, you know, in the preschool uh, schools. Yes. Like parents are not taking preschool seriously. Uh, they are either taking directly admission in first standards and all. Like very, uh, in, uh, not only in my school, all the schools. Yes. So I just I want to I think, you know, um, what's happening is there are a lot of uh, issues involved here because a lot of parents think that in the kindergarten, nothing is done. Everything is done in class one. So exactly. one could be a financial angle. However, uh, sometimes I think most schools are reaching out to parents. I think it's important for you to educate parents around your uh, neighborhood, your community. Yeah. Yeah. And actually tell them the importance of early childhood education Explain to them that the early childhood has now been brought into the formal setup. It's being recognized as part of school. Earlier, it you know, we would think of school only from class one. It's so, not there anymore. It's come into a regular system. And how being in that school helps them. Being, being in school in the early years, early childhood years, helps them to come into class one. So I think you have to reach out and tell parents actually what is happening. You are very right. Most schools have seen a drop in admissions. And, you know, they've become uh, a lot of, they've, they're so comfortable with this online thing. Yeah, yes, ma'am. That's what I was going to tell. That they are saying everything is available in YouTube. Yes. So why to send in school and all? They are learning uh, nowadays. They are learning from uh, picking up everything from YouTube. You why know, if they're doing school. that, let them be for a while. <laughs> By the time their children are six, yeah. six years old, they'll realize that YouTube, I mean, you can look at YouTube, <laughs> but you still don't learn. You still have to go to school. Yeah. And so one more question. Yeah. One more query I had, like, how to handle the helicopter parents, you know? They are so positive when they come to the uh, means, uh, pre uh, kindergarten. They are so over positive. They are Google you know, parents, actually. Helicopter parents have separation <laughs> anxiety. <laughs> Yeah, okay, we, we can look at that. Helicopter parents, yeah. we need to figure out their reason for hovering. Yeah. Uh, or the power struggle and that they have. Interfering also, ma'am. Interfering also. And in each and every month, they know more than the teachers in their, no? Okay, Educators, so we, they know. <laughs> we'll, look at, we'll look at a session where we can do dealing with parents, how to deal with yes, parents. Yes. Sure, ma'am, sure, ma'am. Yeah, sure. And we'll put in this, uh, Avant Avantika Priyanka, maybe we can make a yeah. note of this. Yes. How to deal with parents and we can, you know, there are various kinds of parents. There are overprotective, helicopter, there, there are parents who are neglectful. We have a whole yes. lot. You know, yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Various slots. So we can do that. Yeah. Thank How you, ma'am. to deal Thank with so parents. Much. Definitely we can do that. And in fact, uh, dealing with parents at a PTM, parent-teacher meeting or a parent-teacher interaction, you know, yes, card day, we can, we can cover those things. All right. Okay. Thank you, so ma'am. Good. We've ma got. Uh, we've at least got an idea about what you'd like in the coming. Uh, you know, in the coming year. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Sunal. Thank you. I could also see one uh, hand raised uh, by Jeshree. Silvi. Right? Jeshree, ma'am, if you have, uh, if you have a query, you can just unmute yourself. Okay. Bye. Think she's already... I can see uh, Sylvie ma'am's got a hand on her screen. Uh, Sylvie ma'am, if you if you would like to unmute and ask your question. All right, then shall we uh, close for today? Thank you everyone for coming in on a Saturday evening, long weekend. It's been very nice of you. I mean, I, I was talking to Avantika Priyaka earlier in the day and I said, you know, I don't really think many people will come today because of the festive season. So thank you for coming and we'll meet again. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, everyone. A very good evening to all of you and a very happy Holi. Have happy, a, yes. Yeah. Have a have great fun and have a good long weekend. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Have a thank happy you. and safe Holi. Safe Holi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.